Good day and welcome to another episode of Workers' Power with me, Ms. Parks. And today we are having a very, very special interview and a special focus on a very important leader of the liberation movement, that being Comrade Chris Hani. And to assist me with unpacking who was Chris Hani, why he was important and why even he's important today, is Vuyo Toli from the NUMSA Education Department. So, stay tuned for more. Hi everybody, we're back for another episode of Workers' Power. And today, as we said in our intro, today we're actually going to have a special focus on Comrade Chris Hani, because it is the month of April, and traditionally this is the month where we commemorate the passing uh, of Comrade Chris Hani, and we mm. reflect on him and reflect on his memory. And to help me with this is, of course, the head of education at NUMSA, Comrade Vuyo Doli. Comrade, thank you so much for joining us on Workers' Power. Thanks, Comrade Parks. A revolutionary greetings to you. Yeah. So on this uh, day, we often are bombarded in the media of stories of Comrade Chris. And of course, their focus is always on the assassination. We think it's important to remind people of who Chris was when he was alive. What were his values? What did he stand for? And with that in mind, I'd like us to just begin this discussion by playing this clip, courtesy of ENCA, where he actually unpacks his ideological beliefs. Mm -hmm. So, let's watch. Socialism per se has not failed. But like, like any other system, it is prone to tragic mistakes by groups and individuals we implement it. And in that case, there's no exception. Capitalism has failed in the most catastrophic manner. It has been responsible for the most devastating wars. The First World War, the Second World War. Capitalism has seen the most serious depression in the 30s, where millions of people lost their jobs. Equally, socialism is going through a turbulent period. Uh, it has collapsed virtually in a number of European countries. It is uh, experiencing some serious traumas in the Soviet Union. For me as a communist, I see this as temporary failures because the basic contradictions of any capitalist society remain. Exploitation, class domination, poverty, and unemployment. And I believe workers will never accept capitalism as a solution. So you can hear for yourself, Will. Um, he says there, he talks about how capitalism has failed the working class. Mm. Capitalism has no solutions for the working class. And isn't it interesting that more than 30 years after this man was assassinated, his words are still true even today? Thanks, Comrade Parks, once more for the opportunity. Indeed, so many years after he was ruthlessly, you know, assassinated. And uh, you can, one can conclude very easily that even the future of the country at that moment, in a way, was stolen through such a merciless uh, murder. But um, the words are staying ever relevant because the conditions of the working class that he, at the time, in this uh, clip that we've played, he, he spoke of, you know, the conditions of the black working class majority, the, the conditions of, of poor infrastructure, the inferior, in fact, economic apartheid, the design, everything, you know, that those conditions were created to subjugate the working class and subject them to inferior conditions. That is still relevant, no matter how many times the working class has continued to participate in elections, nothing has changed for the qualitative uh, betterment for the working class. So his words actually remain relevant, and uh, he's a comrade who is a source of inspiration for us in the struggles we're waging as a working class uh, organizations. And I think you're making a very interesting point there, Buyo, because he's he very 
clearly articulates the conditions, poverty, unemployment, inequality, as being the burning issues of the working class. And, you know, for those who've done a lot of research, a lot of reading around Comrade Chris, this is a man who cared deeply about the working mm. class, cared deeply about mobilizing them so that to free themselves uh, from, from their chains. Uh, what are some of the, the things that you can perhaps uh, sort of add uh, on, on this issue in terms of what you know about Comrade Chris? Well, Comrade Parks, I think it's, it's it, perhaps not to do a long uh, history on, on, on Comrade Chris, but perhaps to deal with phases, moments in the history of this great revolutionary. Mm. Uh, we must always remi remind ourselves as comrades waging the class struggle today that we stand on the shoulders of revolutionary giants like Comrade Chris. You know, born in, uh, I think Comrade Parks that even, you know, the conditions that he was born in, mm. uh, in the Transkei area district called Tofimvaba at the time in 1942, um, and of course, this is a moment of, you know, 1913 land, Native Land Act is in operation. The black majority have a tiny portion of the land. Families in the rural areas, the reserve, the Bantu stands, the townships, they relied, of course, in terms of the people who were going to be working in the areas, Sugar Cape Plantation, Natal, Cape Town, mm -hmm. the metros, uh, Johannesburg, at the time, Northern Transvaal, the Transvaal area because of the mining activity. So he... His beginnings, where he comes from, actually, he comes from humble beginning. And through interacting with that, even though at the time, perhaps theoretical, a text will not have interacted with them growing up, you know, attending the schools, the missionary schools, uh, going to church, the Catholic church. He interacted with a number of objective conditions, which slowly began to shape uh, his thinking. And I think... Particularly, it is a time when the comrade now is the University of Forte, you know, interacting with the likes of Omgov, Omre, Gavin Big, Raymond Kla by the time, who he became part of socialist study groups there. And he began interacting, for instance, texts such as What is Marxism by Emil Benz and other classics uh, of, of, of revolutionary thought. Grow, through that, forming part of the cells, you know, becoming member of a party mm -hmm. and all of through those values, these are the kind of, uh, it's, 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 what I'm trying to say is, is the conditions um, around him and how from the conditions that he grew, grew up and the material, the concrete that he was faced with, that then shapes his thinking at a very, very young age because as a university student and so he was very young at the time. So this now prepares him for the next phase of his life uh, that was going to be the, in exile. Yeah. And in fact, let's talk about exile, because this was a man who he wasn't just a revolutionary in terms of theory and his theoretical understanding of, you know, uh, socialism and the material conditions that affect the working class. No, this was a man who, you know, he, he he's what he believed in. He acted on. Mm. Right. Mm. He mm. was a member of the liberation movement. He went Shh. underground. Mm. He, he, he went into exile into Zambia. There's um, an, a very interesting interview where he talks about how they cross the Zambian, oh, um, sure. the, the river mm. at night, mm. the Zambezi, mm. sorry, they crossed the Zambezi at night, mm. um, trying to evade the apartheid forces. Um, and he also talks at length about the training he received mm. in Moscow. Um, perhaps you can talk to us a little bit more about that and how that contributed to this man who later became, you know, so feared by the apartheid machinery. Thanks, Comrade Parks. Uh, you know, Comrade Chris Sani, or let's say uh, perhaps his name as was born in the lower Sabalele village in Tofimva, in the Transkai at the time. They called him the parents Martin Tembisile. Uh, but in this case, it's very, the question that you're asking in terms of moving from his upbringing and the, and the, the exile life. Mm, mm. Very interesting that, of course, because of the conditions of the underground that the comrades had to go underground at the time in order to begin to organize themselves to defeat the, the notorious apartheid regime. He was then given, I think he was moving with a comrade by the name of Ashis Beko. They were 
going to be crossing. Of course, if you were to leave South Africa to go in the camps in Tanzania, it had to be done in a very secret uh, methods. So he got a name, uh, Nom de Guerre, Chris, and then this name stuck with him. It, 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 this it became his name. Like mm. any other comrades, you can think of uh, other revolutionary giants whose names really were shaped in those moments. Of course, Governor Parks, uh, he, he would have crossed and uh, in exile. One of the important things is that when he arrived in the camps, of course, the, the tradition was that Comrade uh, Oliver Tambo and other leadership of the in Tanzania, they will welcome the, the new leader. Chris Ani, we must remember, he was very young mm. uh, at the time when these comrades are, are actually crossing. In fact, we can say Comrade Parks, he would have dedicated mm. the jewel, you know, the precious times of his youth to the struggle to liberate the masses in this country. Mm. So he went uh, briefly at a moment in, 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 in exile, you know, in Tanzania, but because his, his his leadership skills, you know, what he demonstrated, his passion, yeah. his commitment, burning desire for revolution. The leadership at the time identified him as one of the key comrades who can go and receive training because Lenin reminds us very well in terms of the Russian revolution that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Therefore, the comrade went and remember Russia at the time, after 1917, the conditions, working class, uh, you know, at least Russia was a condition, was, was an area where comrades can go, you know, learn theory and also practical activities which you need to wage an underground military strike. Comrade Krisani, I can say, Comrade Parks, that he embodied mm. the four fundamental pillars mm. of the of, of the liberation struggle mm. that define the liberation struggle and amongst them we can count the area of mass mobilization mm -hmm. armed operations mm -hmm. the underground organization and also the international solidarity in the way that he operated and as was being prepared uh, in moscow and other areas too he was already having the burning desire immediately came uh, back and then when they, they came back to the camps and as Perfectly, you mentioned that part of the activities, of course, was a political commissar responsible for agitating uh, new recruits, capacitating them, giving them ideological orientation in Marxist Leninist theory. Just like uh, Comrade Hoshimin, for instance, teaches us that, you know, we must teach everyone Marxist Leninist theory. Mm. And uh, from there, it's not good enough to just know the theory, you must practice it. Comrade Christian practiced, mm. you know, they, they crossed around 1962, they began to, as you say, crossing the Zambians, preparing themselves so that they build camps inside at the time Rhodesia. Mm. They are going to wage forces, a fight. At least we can mention two uh, interactions. One, he was involved in the Wanke campaign. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, he, with, with about 50 to 79 comrades who they were moving with, you know, very young, energetic, physically built. They were cut for because they understood that the revolution, uh, you know, it also needs one to be physically, mm. the commitment that they had to do. So he led that. And I think even though it was one can, comrades, sometimes they conclude that, well, it was defeated, but the tactical battle at the time, I think the MK recruits working together with Zebra forces in Zimbabwe, because it was an alliance, and yeah. they actually were decisive at that battle of Wanki, they won. And after that, Comrade Chris and other comrades had to be taken, and they were arrested in, 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 in Botswana for a little bit until they were released again back to Zambia and Lusaka. You know, the things that you are actually unpacking for us are things that we don't often hear anymore. It's almost as if the MK movement was just, um, it was not really uh, an armed struggle, the way that, you know, history has sort of um, mm. presented it, certainly in the way that the mainstream media sort of likes to present it. Mm -hmm. And yet it literally was, <coughs> pardon me, a, a violent armed um, struggle. People died. I mean, mm. Comrade Chris talks in these documentaries about how in the places where he was hiding, in some of the countries that he was hiding, um, and by the way, this assassination that was successful uh, in 1993 was not the first oh, assassination yes. attempt. Oh, yes. There were other um, assassination attempts. There absolutely. was one in Lesotho mm. that he mentions mm. where he says if they had succeeded, they, that they would have even have killed his oh, family. Yes. So there were this this was a real struggle. This there were real people mm. who who were killed as a result of, of these ideas. Mm. Um when we think about where we are in South Africa today, it's 2024. For this youth, so much of what we're talking about seems like an abstract concept. How do you connect the values of Chris Honey with today's youth 
and with the struggles that they're going through today in contemporary South Africa? Oh, Comrade Parks, yeah, no, look, I mean, there's, there's relevance in the values, the embodiment, things that he embodied. For mm -hmm. instance, he was, he was a, a Kaida, you know, a Comrade uh, Ernesto Che Guevara in the context of the Chuban revolution. There's a writing, he talk, talks of the Kaida, the backbone mm. of the revolution. So he was, in a way, in, 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 in speech and in action. He was a, a revolutionary, he was militant, but also the values, you know, um, because he understood that if you are thinking of defeating oppression, if you are thinking of defeating economic exploitation, like we come to NUMSA, for instance, in terms of the aspiration of the constitution, the values, the, the, the strategic objective, he understood that you must practically live those things. In fact, the change that you want to see, you must actively engage. And starting with yourself mm. and Comrade Amilka Cabral, among others, they reminded us that you have to struggle against your weaknesses. Comrade Chris dedicated, even when he was young, you know, amongst others, dedicating time to study. Even though this was a leader, at some point, chief of staff was the commander, a political commissar. He had a very senior responsibility, even at the time, Comrade Parks, when they were uh, crossing that, that one, the, being the first one mm. was joyful, trivial, crossing it. He actually had the massive responsibility that the leadership entrusted in him because of the values, you know, commitment to democracy, to non-racialism, to non-sexism, and uh, you know, fundamental pillars that ought to define any socialist uh, organization, you know, a left-leaning organization, including uh, international solidarity. Mm. So. One of the examples, for instance, as we go down in history, you know that uh, there is a document called, it's very easy to be accessible if comrades want to see it online, the Chris Sani Memorandum. Mm -hmm. uh, he somehow was a co he was part of the authors, uh, but it was written Hani Memorandum. But his comrade, they worked, it was a collective. But at the time, they were reflecting comrade parks critical in terms of the state mm -hmm. of things. You ask a question in terms of conditions today and conditions we would have faced. Even in exactly. exile, there were contradictions within the organization. Some of the leadership he criticized in terms of pursuing careerism. Mm. People were now becoming professional politicians instead of becoming professional revolutionaries. Mm. All of those, he was highly critical, uh, including self-criticism and criticism. And he never was a comrade to hide in a corner mm. and decide to gossip. He will put the matter right in front. So there was the, the Morogoro conference, for instance, which in 1969, they were not invited because they were considered. I think there's an interview where he speaks very vividly mm, yes. about these moments. He's passionate. Mm -hmm. And I will encourage people, if they can find, they must look for it on the mm. internet. But they were excluded by that Morogoro conference. He, in his view, began because of the youth, because of the comrades were critical and they stayed true to, to their values. It helped at least to shape up the, the policy, the strategy for liberation and, you know, to make it much more radical. Because what he was fighting for was that, like Comrade Mzala Nomalo and others, you know, to say, whilst we are busy preparing in exile to prepare ourselves, we must go back home and fight to, to liquidate and defeat. So if you look at those values, Comrade Parks, and you look at the society that we are faced with today as young people and people in general, we are dealing with all sorts of the negotiated settlement that has lived since 1994 has long far reached its expiry date. Yeah. It continues to expire by the day. It rots every day. The decay that is taking place in society, corrupt capitalism itself, complete in, in, its, in essence, it's a corrupt system. Mm. Therefore, it's bound to have all of those things. And I think if as young people, as comrades, as generally in our working class organization, we can reconnect with these values, not for the purpose of just saying we are going to the grave or commemorating complete crisis, that kind of stuff that is more of a ceremonious, no, revolutionary activity. Mm. Comrade Ho Chi Minh emphasized this in the mm. political schools in Vietnam in the 50s, mm. uh, that look, you, it's, it's why teaching Marxism theory to everyone is not good enough to just know the theory. You must actually act. Kwame Nkrumah, another revolutionary who reminds us that thought without action you know, is blind. You yeah. know, in action without thought is and all of that. So it, it's very important that we must not just ceremoniously remember these moments, these revolutionaries like Chris, but we must actually ask ourselves, in the conditions that we're faced with, what is it that we can learn from them to address concretely our objective conditions yeah. we faced with? You know, when you speak about Comrade Chris, I realize 
just how much we have lost as a country in terms of a, a revolutionary mm. leader. And I think some of that has been lost over the years in terms of the discourse. Mm. And I just want to take our viewers back by uh, playing an excerpt of the TRC hearings where Clive Darby Lewis confesses uh, to 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 the TRC about the real motivation as to why they chose Chris Honey out of all mm. of the liberation leaders, why it was Chris that had to mm. be assassinated. Mm. Just watch this. We discussed how best we could strike a crippling blow against the communist leadership as the real enemy. It was obvious to us that the late Chris Honey, as the leader of the Communist Party, was the real threat to our future and that of the Republic of South Africa. Um, the whole objective was to plunge the country into a situation where as a result of the chaos which we anticipated would occur as a result of the assassination, that people on the right would be inspired to mobilize and use this vacuum caused by the chaos to effect a counter-revolution and to take over power of the country. That was the whole object, and I mean, that's why a man like the late Chris Harney had to be the target. Because, I mean, imagine if, if we targeted anyone else, anyone else, there was no one that had the sort of following that the late Chris Harney had. And as I said earlier, I said, perhaps it was even a, a tribute to the status of Chris Harney that he was selected as a target. So you hear for yourself from the horse's mouth, hmm. from <laughs> the yeah. bastion of right wing backwardness and fascism, how they felt about Chris. Chris was somebody who actually inspired so much fear mm. amongst the right-wing mm. Afrikaners, specifically at that moment in time. Mm. Chris's assassination was really a, a, a very, very seminal moment in South African history. We were on the verge of a civil war as a result of, of that assassination. Mm. Um, as we sort of finalize this discussion, what are some of the lessons that we can take from Comrade Chris, from how he lived his life, from his values? How do we, uh, not just within NUMSA, but as those of us who care about um, advancing the working class, how do we also take forward his vision into a truly brighter future for what you know, the working class in South Africa deserves? Thanks, Comrade Parks. I think you mentioned, you, you played the clip with the Clive Debbie Lewis, of course, uh, acting common purpose with the likes of uh, Janos Swalus and so forth. That's why I said earlier that by that barbaric, the murderous, uh, murderous uh, I remember on TV, the, the then president at the time, Nelson Mandela, who mm. had to step in and address, noting the moment that he actually said that the country at the time was teetering on the brink of disaster yeah. because of this comrade, comrade Chris, and the, the aspirations, you know, they, you, you know, comrade Parks, there are a few clips that even exist just before I come to your questions in terms of connecting him to our working class organizations, the insights, what mm. is, what you must do. The, when he came back, the short stint between 90 and, 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 and the untimely and unfortunate time when they took him out in 1993, April, um, that moment you see him addressing uh, uh, platforms in mm. Bisho, in Bisho, when the, the Bisho massacre, mm. he addressed the, together the companies, Roni Castries and others, and other areas where he was taking platform, you could see that the, he had the aspirations of the people in him mm. as he addressed them. He moved, he understood, he understood that in any revolutionary moment, the key ingredient if you are building in a revolution, you have to take seriously the aspirations of the masses. What is the will of the people? You know, and, and he's one leader that actually respected that. And I think for brutal characters like Clive W. Lewis and the system, mm. because they are actors, they are agents oh, who, the who delivered the blow on behalf yes. of the, the apartheid, capitalist, oppressive uh, system. And of course, he, the, he, 
In fact, I think they considered them as, as enemy, him as enemy number one Absolutely. or some kind. Absolutely, they were you terrified. Know, you know, in the apartheid, the words you used the Roy Khafar. Yes, yeah, Swart Khafar. Swart Khafar. Mm. So, in other words, the communist, mm. to deal with the communist. And those things, corporate parks, even today, there's a red scare mongering around communism mm. as, and, and any aspirations that the people can actively, actively democratically participate in arrangements, social, political, econ every arrangement of a sphere. Comrade Christine understood what the principle of the Freedom Charter were mm. in terms of restoring everything to the ownership. And when you say the people shall govern, it doesn't mean that every year the people come to the elections, they become a voting forder. Mm. You know, if you read mm. the, mm. the, the special, uh, special National Congress resolution that the masses every time, because we're dealing with, there's also every time they're considered a voting forder. No, no. Comrade Chris believe that we must actively take part as people. Mm. He will not have championed the demobilization that we have seen after 1994. No, he was very, very clear that he opposed it. Absolutely. Yeah. He believed that whilst to building democracy, um, when you are a socialist government, it doesn't mean that it must be an undemocratic. You okay. still sustain democratic participation. And there are countries, there are examples, for instance, if you see countries like Cuba, Venezuela, where all guns of people's power, the people participate, not this thing that we go to vote, and from then on we are becoming they pariahs. Us, they tell us we're free. We are but, free. But we have yet to reap the benefits it's of not freedom, yet. right? It's not yet. It's, 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 only, it's only the elites that are reaping the benefits of the freedom. The minority are enjoying, are yes. enjoying the benefits of freedom. They're enjoying the fruits of democracy, but the masses remain locked yes. up. No, Comrade Parks, absolutely. I think if we were to take the values of this Comrade, mm. and let me take this opportunity that, look, why is yes, the, because like Comrade Marx and the, the others have said that, the working class of any nation mm. must first deal amongst us with this national bourgeoisie. Of course, we must wrestle and deal with capitalism here. But Comrade Chris, one of the fundamental, which is critical in building a working class organization, the issue of solidarity. Yeah. Injury to one is an injury, injury to, to all. all. As we're talking, of course, we know, Comrade, the relentless genocide mm. by Zionist forces. Mm. In uh, tens and th of thousands of people, counting children, women, mm. daily, probably as we're having the conversation, there's count still. Yeah. You know, th there's those kind of situation, you know, there's a f people in Western Sahara fighting for their emancipation. Mm. In, in Swaziland, comrades are fighting. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, there, were, there are organizations there that are revolutionary. And also noting what imperialism wages against countries that pursue socialism as an alternative, the embargo right. that is faced by Cuba. And NUMSA would have spoken as an organization, as a point in terms of international solidarity, mm. continue to raise. So I think there's a lot we can learn. As long as the, the system, corporate parks, uh, stays intact, we, there are values that we must continue. It's like going to the well and drink water. Mm. Go and interact with the ideas like Comrade Krisani and other many revolutionaries, Field Moore and many others that we can tap into whose insights must shape us and ask ourselves, given these subjective conditions, what is it that we should be doing as working class organ to deal a decisive blow on the system? Powerful ending. Thank you so much, Comrade uh, Vuyo. And in fact, I want to end this special broadcast by quoting Comrade Chris here when he says, quote, socialism is not about big concepts and heavy theory. Mm. Socialism is about decent shelter for those who are homeless. It's about water for those who have no safe drinking water. It is about health care. It is about a life of dignity for the old. It is about overcoming mm. the huge divide between urban and rural areas. It is about a decent education for all our people. Yeah. Socialism is about rolling back the tyranny of the market as long as the economy is dominated by an unelected, privileged few. Mm. The case for socialism will exist. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Workers' Power. We hope to see you again soon. Don't forget to click like, don't forget to subscribe, and we look forward to seeing you for another episode of Workers' Power. Remember to follow Noomsa Media on YouTube. Like, subscribe, and share to as many people as you know.